Good morning and good afternoon and welcome to InnerSource in Financial Services as part of the InnerSource Commons Full Summit. I'm James McLeod, Finos Director of Community, and I'm joined here today by Russell Green from Deutsche Bank, Andrew Aitken from Wipro, Alex Chittick from Lloyds Banking Group, Dove Katz from Morgan Stanley, Vital Monterio from GitHub, and Sleona Bonewald from IEEE, who's going to be speaking about her PayPal experience. So Sleona, uh, is it okay to go over to you? So maybe you can tell us, what is InnerSource in relation to your banking experience? Well, InnerSource was a way for PayPal to collaborate among business units. Um, PayPal owns a lot more than just PayPal. You know, it owns Braintree, it owns Venmo, it owns a lot of different ones. And Denise was already bringing the open source religion there. And we realized because of banking and regulations and things of that nature, we really couldn't ever go completely open source. Um, so it's like, how do we bring that culture and those processes in there to kind of uh, allow everyone to collaborate better? And so that's what the focus was. And so there was a good amount of support in that in regards to PayPal because of the fact that they did realize that they needed to coordinate a lot of those various business units. So for the rest of the panel, does, does anybody have a differing view or does anybody else have an idea of what um, InnerSource means in relation to their banking firm? So um, Russell, um, with regards to, to Deutsche Bank, what does InnerSource mean to you? It's a way of optimizing our portfolio, bringing reuse, solving common business problems. But I also think um, I also think it's a way of, it's a culture change and educational exercise as well, because it allows our global engineering program, our kind of lead technologists to influence and work directly with large numbers of people across the organization and share best practices and kind of commuting and, and create a culture across the organization. So in the source is, is more than just the, the sharing of code. Similar to the open source community, you get people of like minds, of interests gathering around. So it's a great cultural shift in the organization from, you know, the legacy developing in silos where people don't talk. So I think that's one of the biggest benefits that we get from developing an inner source program. And Andrew, um, from your role within Wipro, I know that you work across, you know, multiple financial services firms. Do you see any differences between how people are operating in, in the source or whether people are doing it at all? Uh, first thing I'd like to say is that inner source and, and open source aren't, aren't the same thing. I think it's a good point to start to start with is that if you're going down a path of inner source, which is the application of open source development best practices inside an organization has nothing to do with the technology per se, right? So, just because you're doing inner source also doesn't mean you have to do open source, right? Sometimes for organizations that are more conservative or more constrained, they might be able to start with inner source, build some of that collaborative culture, and then begin to engage more in open source. So that's the first one. The second thing is <clears throat> in working with a number of, of different financial institutions, one of the challenges that we've seen common challenges is uh, I've, I've heard this a number of times saying, hey, we've got 400 different agile teams and we've managed to create 400 different silos and so there's you can use elements of inner source to help create or bridge some of these agile silos that are created inside the organization so i'll, I'll leave it there for a second and dave i understand within morgan stanley um inner source is something that you're also um pursuing what does um inner source mean to morgan stanley that Thanks. First, I, I think there are probably two areas of inner source that we're pursuing. You know, we have large enablement teams or small relative to the population of our developers uh, that are providing common tools, uh, you know, for CI, CD, for, uh, you know, shared infrastructure libraries. And historically, the relationship between us and our customers has been, you know, throw something in our backlog. You know, with InnerSource, we're able to extend the offer to the developers. You want a feature, put it in, give us a PR. That whole relationship between we're no longer just the customers of this, but we're actually able to contribute enhancements and work more closely in partnership with the providers. It really opens up and, and changes the, the game. It allows these teams that are kind of highly concentrated talent to support a large group of people to scale, to, to really allow 
features not to just be backlogged on a specific number of people that are by no means the monopolists of the expertise to do it. So why should they be the only people empowered to do it? So over time, I think it's really allowed us to scale and we're, we're, watching, uh, we're watching that. And the other area where it's happened is areas where cool tools are being built by people who wanna share them, but they don't have a logical owner. And they don't go anywhere, they don't belong to anyone. And we just need a way to, like ordinarily you would just open source that and everybody who wants to be part of it would. With Intersource, it's kind of the exact same model. We need a place to park it where we can start to build a community of people who are interested in contributing to it. And it isn't one person's job to support it. It's not a team's formal mandate to support it. Um, but it allows the growth and collaboration and innovation to take place across multiple silos, as was just mentioned. And, and that's another area that, you know, just adopting the right technology and attitude and culture has really opened up opportunities for us. Thank you, Dave. And Alex, welcome back to the, to the discussion. Maybe we can go back to you from a Lloyds Banking Group um, point of view. Um, what does InnerSource mean to Lloyds Banking Group? Sure. So um, Lloyds is a very large organization that's divided into lots of vertical business units all operating in the same domain. For us, InnerSource is a way of bridging the gap between those business units, making sure that we're not duplicating effort on thinking implementation um, to incrementally improve the solutions that we deliver, making sure that we're delivering faster and we're delivering with greater certainty. That's awesome. Um, and Vitor, uh, welcome to the call today. Um, can you tell me from a, from a GitHub point of view, you know, what does InnerSource actually mean to you um, and the teams you actually help inside a banking firm? Hi James, a pleasure to be here. But, uh, if I may, I would hook up to what Andrew said. I think it's very important to kind of simplify uh, inner source to be the same as open source and the only difference being the visibility scope. And one of the, th one of the reasons why I think that's important is for people to take a step back and remember that the success of open source was organic and was motivation led by individuals that created this community. And I think that's a very important lesson for inner source programs because there wasn't a program manager that defined the success of open source. So whatever platform is put in place has to leverage an organic growth and, and maintenance model. So I think, I think that, that the, the way that Andrew summarized it in the beginning saying they are the same thing, I think it's something that it's very easy to forget as inner source con continues or, or starts to be its own uh, topic of conversation and its own and has its own identity, but we should never forget that um, uh, we can learn a lot about how how the model thrived on on the open source, and and never forget in bringing those lessons back into the the, the scope that defines the inner the the, the inner source visibility. So thank you everybody for explaining uh, what in the source is in relation to your bank and through do doing so I believe you've also um, answered the question why you're doing it. And so now we'll be good to actually move on to how you're doing it because I believe this, this may differ through your banking experiences as well. And so maybe Russell if we come over to you can you tell me how is uh, Deutsche Bank implementing in the source? How do you engage with it? Um, <clears throat> Okay, yeah, the, just like to a couple of things. Um, I mean, simply we, we, we allow people, we, we have standard um, kind of source code repositories. Um, effectively, the, we did take a very simple approach to um, our open sourcing. Uh, we have a centralized uh, website that allows people to go and look and effectively to participate and to um, uh, share your code through the open source community at Deutsche Bank, effectively you put a small XML file into the bottom root directory of your, your repository and it will effectively pick it up and with a description allow you to participate. So it's a, we, we basically have a very, very lightweight um, way of actually getting your, publishing your code into the central um, open source community. And then it's, we, we obviously then have a series of engineering days where people talk about their open source projects, from my business. And, you know, it's a lot of, I think a lot of communication to make inner sourcing successful. But also from a, from a, from a central kind of, what should you, what should you inner source? I think 
lots of discussions around this, right? People are very good at building small, lightweight UI frameworks and things like that. But personally, you know, there, I think there is a little difference in scope between inner source and open source. I think trying to compete with an, an open source community on something like a UI framework is basically banging your head against a brick wall. So, you know, when you do inner source things, it's got to be, it's got to have more scope around the functionality or the services that are unique or you're ahead of the game within the within the organization that you're in a sourcing it because you don't want to just in a source something where you're competing against the open source environment that doesn't really make sense you should participate in the open source community for that type of project so there is there is some level of kind of a guidance i think that we put over the projects that we want to in a source but that's brilliant and so Yona, from um, a paypal um perspective how did the paypal teams um engage with inner source and what was the epiphany that inner source was actually needed the um orchestration tooling for lack of a better term it's basically code ideation to production and inner sourcing that and i've got i got velocity like they'd never seen before because suddenly all the different teams from all of the different business units could add what they needed in regards to going through that whole CI, CD, testnet process to production code. And that was super useful um, where we got things like we got CI, CD in, which we didn't have previously. We got it on the cloud. And then we also got things like database as a service where things could be allocated in minutes instead of weeks and a lot of things along those lines. To me, one key element of that though was inner sourcing the product managers, not just the coders. So they themselves were actually participating in the allocation of time, helping those developers find one another and changing their workflow from what it had previously been. Previously, you know, too often product ends up do, being a, a checklist monitor. And instead, they were talking with each other, navigating, negotiating, um, deciding on a common UX for that orchestration tool, a lot of things of that nature. And it was, it was pretty phenomenal to watch. Thank you. Um, and Alex, what is, um, how did the teams in Lloyd's Banking Group um, engage in InnerSource? And how have you actually educated the engineers to be able to do it? So the teams here are collaborating around a central site where we are creating an inner source marketplace. So it's where people can go and see what has been built elsewhere within the organization. We're trying to center that at the moment around disciplines, which have their own communities of practice around them. Um, the, we're trying to embed some of inner source into the teams. It's, it's still kind of early days. so. Some of the teams are very forward thinking. They know how to build in a sort of project to understand what is the right size and shape for one, whereas other teams need a lot more guidance. They need to understand how they can do that as part of their day. But the fundamental bit for us was creating that place where everyone could go and see what was available. They could see that there was a community behind it and that they would want to get engaged and involved in that community. Thank you. Um, and Dave, uh, within Morgan Stanley, how are the teams um, in the sourcing and have there been any steep learning curves for engineers who may not have done it before? I, I wouldn't say there have been steep learning curves because at the end of the day, it's code going in for a pull request and that part of life they're familiar with. For, you know, we, not everyone, you know, maybe in, in the last year, we're 95% Git, but there's some pre-Git based source controls just moving to Git alone enabled tremendous amount. Just it's, it's conducive to this kind of contribution uh, uh, culture, if you will. Um, and internally, we have, a, we have a project portal and the project portal has the ability for us to flag projects as uh, open for contribution. Um, I'm really keen to talk to both Alex and Russell about some of the things they're doing with open source or inner source marketplaces. Sounds like a good project for, for open sourcing itself because uh, it would be good to build that internally in the enterprise. Um, we have a pretty neat, you know, neat uh, uh, inner sourcing scoreboard, which is, I guess, kind of to recognize the people who have done it. Uh, and uh, you know, that's just doing simple maths of people who are not permission to the project in a kind of ownership role, making contributions. And that has been a great way to celebrate the, uh, the culture of inner source that we've been growing. Um, and I think that as well, the kind of thing that could be inner sourced or open source because it's, pretty much working off of commit data for the most part. Uh, and 
uh, you know, that, that's been very helpful at, at drawing people in. But, but it's really been, you know, for us, the majority of projects within our sourcing have come from teams really providing something that is shared by multiple teams and no longer wait, making the customer wait until they can implement the next feature. So it's been very customer driven just between the technology customers and those teams already providing things. Um, a few of those shared tools going down that route as well. I think an inner source marketplace would further accelerate that beyond just kind of having flags in the project portal that we have for, uh, you know, open for contribution. I mean, every project should kind of be open for contribution to a certain degree. So that's great. So maybe, maybe we can explore the marketplace now. So Russell, um, are you able to talk us through what the marketplace is and, you know, how we, it's implemented, how teams engage with it and how it furthers your inner source activities? Just so that we can give um, Dave um, a few answers to his questions. Yeah, I mean, it's like I said, uh, the, the, the marketplace is effectively where you can register your product um, and then we track, we track usage and uh, branches and contributions similar to um, Dave said around the level of scoring. But it really is simple as describing the project. We stick a little JSON file in the root directory of all the source control systems with a uh, basic information. Um, and then that's centrally aggregated, collected by a script, which then uh, formats it and publishes it as a, as a marketplace. Uh, with a small database behind it to keep on the stats, uh, the stats of all of the projects. The um, interestingly, though, um, we're trying to mature um, as we move to the cloud. Um, we've kind of started to um, one, of, one of the problems we have in our application space is around uh, understanding which requirements have been met. So um, policies, procedures. That's a uh, that's a very manual exercise today. So um, one of the things we're trying to do is formalize what we call architecturally significant requirements through to design decisions, through to reference frameworks or implementation frameworks that actually uh, meet those, those requirements. And that's, that becomes a, a metadata a model that we can then use. And what's really nice about that is as we move to the cloud and we move towards common services or logging or and those kind of things, we can actually track who's using which open source project or inner source code, which then goes through which requirements have met, which principles have done. So not only by people using the code that is provided centrally um, and in the marketplace, we can also then start to track the compliance to certain architectural or regulatory compliance. So that inner source culture um, has massive value add for reuse beyond just code reuse. It's, it becomes compliance, risk reduction, all of those types of things that we struggle with within organizations. Um, so coming back to how teams are actually engaging in inner source, um, Andrew, it would be really awesome to hear about, you know, how you're observing teams across the industry um, in, engaging and uh, whether people are doing it differently to what we've heard on the call today. People are doing it differently. Um, one of the first things I think that's important to recognize is this is a multi-year effort to be successful, right? Um, this takes time, energy, commitment, resources to, to make successful across a large enterprise or a large institution. And what we've seen happen some, uh, occasionally is, uh, and I like the way that, that Morgan Stanley and Deutsche Bank are going about it, it's an opt-in model. Right? developers opt into this marketplace or contributing. What we've seen happen sometimes is a, uh, there's this initial effort. The initial effort is typically successful because it's a self-selected group of people who may have some open source contribution background, understand the ethos of open source. And so you begin to see in, in this organic model grow within an organization. And then what we've seen happen a couple of times is it begins to get visibility and an executive makes an edict that that's going to be how we're now going to develop. And the fastest way to kill something is to make something an enterprise wide edict. So I, I, we encourage people to start with this opt-in model. And then as you begin to see the value and benefits of it, that you make it an enterprise wide opt-in model as opposed to something, this is how we're going to do it. 
And as you begin to get more and more momentum, you certainly have to provide support and framework and structure around it. You have to provide regular encouragement for developers to participate until they begin to see the actual benefits. But for many people, this is, you know, this is a real cultural change for them. So again, that's why we call it an enterprise-wide opt-in model. Uh, where we tend to see resistance is in middle management. Because now all of a sudden, they, as you begin to spread across an enterprise, you're going to have more people that do want to participate. They may be working for one group that has certain goals and objectives and a, and a middle manager is compensated or incentivized on achieving those goals. And he's beginning to realize these developers are more productive, but not necessarily on what I have to achieve. Thinking about how you're going to incentivize them and taking out that kind of middle layer of resistance is really important element to pay attention to. So Andrew, I really like that um, culture change aspect that you actually reflected on. And James, if I may pick up the, on, on two items there. One example I give to engineering teams is how you can actually drill down much lower on the code. So, and imagine I'm, I just, I've, I've just started writing unit tests and I have no idea how to go and, and, and mock a web server or something like that. I can just go into a search and actually limit, like I want to find a unit test that uses this particular library and I can just instead of going on the internet to find some examples I can actually find suitable examples from my colleagues and that's at the level of a block of code right so having everything visible by default but you 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 can actually drill down on a lot of reusable smaller parts in a company and the other part I would like to talk about is that what Silona did at PayPal in, in terms of measuring the benefits at PayPal is something that a lot of companies struggle with. And I find like one of the holy grails of selling it corp corporation wide. And I think that's brilliant. Um, a lot of the times I focus on convincing the developer because um, as, as a director of a company, if you see what Celona measured in terms of productivity, less redundancy, velocity, that makes sense. But if I'm just writing code on my desk and I'm thinking, well, do I finish this that I've been asked to finish today? Or do I try to, to document it? I try to write unit tests so this becomes reusable. And I often compare inner source to recycling. Um, and that goes to what Andrew says of a multi-year experience in the sense that if I pick up a bottle of plastic now and then just throw it in the, in the regular bin, no one will die of it, right? Um, the world will not become a, a worse place just by, by that. But if everyone does that, we don't have a sustainable future. And the same happens in any company with inner source and, and, and trying to teach the developer that if we all do the right thing from a collaboration and reusability point of view, we'll end up working in a better place overall. So a lot of the times the benefit is not directly to you, at least in the short term. And that long-term gratification of inner source, sometimes it's very hard to, to come across. So definitely teaching people that the benefit is not always yours, but we'll, we're building a better place to work and a better software development company. That is how I try to reach the developers because if you produce what Silona has produced, then the buy-in from companies is going to be automatic almost. Vital, um, do you have any recommendations for how infrastructure teams should actually set up their environments in order to enable inner source? Okay, so I definitely think one thing we try to push for, and it's not always possible, is the, the public or in, internal visibility within the enterprise by default, right? One thing that we've been successful at GitHub is just using search pretty much the same way you look for a book online or, or, or a new dishwasher. Um, using search to find code and reusable codes should be as trivial um, as finding anything else on the internet. So because historically that has not been easy or um, very attainable, I think that leads to something I usually call the search fatigue, is that you try to search for something to reuse once, twice, and then you never do it again. I feel like the, the magical moment is when you're trying to find something to reuse and you actually find it. It's not that hard, right? Because as soon as you get that magic moment, you'll do it again. So Yona, um, when you were establishing inner source in PayPal, did you come up against any resistance from within the PayPal organization? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, in many different forms. 
Um, so thankfully, I had Denise Cooper as my air cover for much of what was happening. Um, and that's why strategically, you know, we first went for that payments group, right? It's because everyone in PayPal had their eyes and ears on that and watching it. And that helped a lot. And then the CEO sitting there saying, oh, no, we need to collaborate more. That helped a lot. And then PayPal is also going through um, a renaissance in regards to understanding what the new best practices are going to be in regards to software development. I think that's a really crucial part is because people are used to open source software. They are used to a new architecture model. They are used to doing, as Andrew said, with Agile. They are used to all of these different pieces mm -hmm. and InnerSource just helps tie all of that together. And to be quite honest, I don't think you can do InnerSource very well if you don't have your CI CD lined up and you don't understand how to get everything in production so that you can have the safety and trust that you need. One of the next big projects was how do we do the orchestration? How do we do the CI CD? How do we get all of those things done? And making that inner source also really helped accelerate the process. Thank you very much. That's, um, that's a really interesting insight. And um, so Andrew, it'll be really interesting to see whether you've seen um, kind of industry resistance to a, any form of you know, cross collaboration within firms. It'll be good to get your point of view on that. Definitely. Uh, uh, definitely see resistance along the lines of, of what Salona described. Uh, I, I think, you know, we, we have so, uh, some organizations here represented here today, maybe Morgan and Deutsche Bank are a little bit more mature in their use of, of inner source than many or actually most other financial institutions out there. Um, what we try and promote a lot when we get engaged is really around transparency and celebration. And transparency comes in, in first you have to create a baseline, right? If you're, gonna, if, you, if you're gonna produce some metrics to celebrate people's achievements, you have to have, be able to show improvement on your standard, whether, and we like to look at uh, ideation, we like to look at velo code velocity, code quality, code security. And if you're gonna show improvements, do a baseline, at least get some, take a swag at it and say it takes X, Y, Z on average amount of time with number of defects, both quality defects, security defects, and uh, uh, to, to produce a product in the, in the current model or the previous model. Then let's show over time the improvements and let's celebrate those people. And there is a lot of, there is a lot of developer fear out there, there can be. So it's always celebrating the people who are, uh, or, or teams that are really, really showing dramatic improvement or over historical norms and not at all uh, necessarily mentioning those groups that aren't actually making those achievements. So you're really celebrating the, the groups that are making the progress, the, pe the people who are opting into these inner source teams that are, that are making these huge improvements and not necessarily worrying too much about those that aren't. Behind the scenes, you work with them, you help them become more productive. But that's what we call about uh, transparency and, and celebration. And we found that really helps. That's great. And Vitor, are you seeing any form of resistance to inner source from a, a GitHub point of view? If, if, uh, if my focus is on delivering by, uh, by tomorrow, what is it for me to try and make this more reusable, right? And I don't think that's resistance. I, I just think that's the nature of things. So I think it's a bit of, uh, at all levels, motivating people to do the right thing because it is the right thing for the company to align with the bigger picture. A more transparent and more collaborative uh, um, uh, engineering culture that documents uh, what's the purpose of a given repository by having readme's by making collaboration easier by uh, uh, testing your, your code by making it easier for other people to communicate with you either via issues or whatever platform you're using to be receptive to those changes to accept pull requests to seek other main maintainers um, all of that is 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 what uh, what what achieves a proper inner source culture in the end but um, um, the individuals on the ground that, that are writing the code that we want to get reusable, they need to be, to be compensated. And I'm, and I'm not talking necessarily about money, but in terms of uh, just, just highlighting what good behavior is within a company and, um, and promote that, be, that good behavior. 
So finally, I'd like to thank everybody for watching the Inner Source in Financial Services discussion today. I'm James McLeod, Finance Director of Community, and I'd like to say thank you to Russell, Andrew, Alex, Dove, Vitor, Salona for joining me on the discussion panel today. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.